Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this opportunity just to share your word on Resurrection Sunday. God, would you speak to us? Would the resurrection power be manifested in this place this day as we look to your word in Jesus' name? And everyone said, amen. amen. This is the Easter season, the great time of the year. You know, the first Easter message I preached in this church was in 1976. A lot of things have changed since 1976. In 1976, Gerald Ford was president of the United States. Farrah Fawcett's poster and hairstyle were big, as were lava lamps, stingray bicycles, eight-track players, Patch jeans, leisure suits, platform shoes, Jaws, Star Wars, and Saturday Night Live with the original cast. <laughs> the top five television shows of 1976, Happy Days, Laverne and Shirley, ABC Monday Night Movie, MASH, and Charlie's Angels. Rocky won the Academy Award, Best Picture, 1976. Custom vans were the automotive rage, as were no blow dryers. Somehow I missed that one. I just said God by me. Polyester, afros, powder blue tuxedos, spandex pants, and shag haircuts. Here are some words we use all the time now, uh, but we never used in 1976 when I preached my first Easter message. Nobody knew the meaning of internet, email, websites, or dot-coms. Nobody ever heard of cell phones, laptops, desktop PCs, or minivans. You would not have been familiar with terms like satellite or cable TV, fax machines, digital cameras, e-commerce, keyless entry, iPhones, GPS navigational systems, and non-smoking sections. There were not yet three-point shots in basketball or two-point conversions in football. There was no paying at the pump, no ATM machines, no self-adhesive postage stamps, and no motor voter registration. Nobody ever heard of computer dating or computer viruses. Nobody knew about PlayStation or Prozac. Nobody ever heard of test tube babies or AIDS. No one knew the meaning of MTV, CNN, CD, DVD, and MP3. A lot of things have changed in 37 years. But there are some things that haven't changed. The needs of people have not changed at all. And God's answers to those needs have not changed. When I think about the Easter season, I always think about the first followers of Christ and the feelings they must have had when they saw Jesus Christ being put to death on the cross. Can you imagine the devastation and the disillusionment and the disappointment they must have felt? But also imagine the incredible joy and surprise when just three days later, Jesus Christ raised himself back to life again. And the resurrected Jesus changed their lives forever, and he's still changing lives today. In John 8, 31, Jesus made an incredible and profound statement. He said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. Now, what was he talking about? From what does he set me free? The Bible says he wants to set us free in at least three dimensions. First of all, he wants to set you free from the pain of yesterday. And that's a good thing. You know, I've discovered the number one cause of unhappiness in many people is because they are stuck in the past. They're holding on to hurts. They can't relate to the present. They're handicapped to function in the present because they're still reacting to the past. I've discovered there are two kinds of things that people have a tough time getting over. The first one is resentment. Resentment over the way people have hurt them. Jesus wants to set you free from the pain of resentment. Everybody in this building has been hurt by other people. 
And probably you've been hurt many different times, sometimes intentionally and sometimes unintentionally. What you do with that hurt will determine whether you live freely or whether you live in a prison of pain. What have you never gotten over? Is it that failure where you fell flat on your face and it just embarrassed you to death? Is it that abusive relationship, either physically or emotionally, or maybe even sexual abuse? Maybe you still remember the rejection or the ridicule of a parent. That seems to be a constant thing in your life. Maybe you've had a failed marriage. What is it that you've never gotten over? What is it, even as I talk about it, the resentment starts to build up inside of you again, and you start thinking about the people that hurt you? Who do you have a grudge against? Jesus Christ wants to set you free from the pain of resentment so that you can move forward in your life, so you can get unstuck and you can get going forward. The Bible says in Isaiah 43, verse 18, read this with me. The Lord says, forget about what has happened. Do not think about the past. Instead, look at the new thing I am going to do. God says, don't dwell on the past. Let it go. Give up grudges. Let God settle the score. God's keeping record. And who can do a better job in balancing the sheet? You or God. So why don't you just let God handle the people who have hurt you and move forward with your life? God says, don't think about the past. Don't dwell on it. Let it go. Give up your grudges. Let him handle it. You say, Gary, I'd like to do that, but I can't. You don't know how they hurt me. I just can't let it go. It just hurts too bad. I can't forgive. I can't forget. And you know what? You're right. You can't. You need Jesus. You need him to help you. He's the guy that can change it around. You need God's love in your heart. You need supernatural power. You're never going to be free from the past until God is in your life. You'll just keep reacting to things in the past, and it'll keep you from moving ahead into the future. You need Jesus Christ. And folks, I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about a relationship with a living God, Jesus Christ, uniting with him and his supernatural power. I want you to let these words sink into your spirit this morning. Psalm 38, verse 18. Read this with me aloud, please. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those whose spirits have been crushed. Folks, I have no doubt in this group of people today, there are some here with broken hearts. And where is God when you're hurt? He's close to you. That's where he is. You say, I don't feel close to God. Folks, it's not because he's distant. It's because you're not plugged in or you've moved away or you're not aware that he is there. God is close to the brokenhearted. He wants to comfort you. He wants to help you out. He's seen every beat of your heart. He's seen every breath you've taken. He's watched the good and the bad and the ugly in your life. And he still loves you. And he wants to help you get over the pain. He wants to help you with the pain of resentment. God also wants to help you get over the pain of regret. Not only have people hurt you in life, but you and I have done some dumb things too. Can I get an amen on that? We've made some stupid mistakes. We've blown it. We've hurt other people. We've all made mistakes, so we are candidates for regret. Guilt is a terrible thing to carry around. It just leaves us miserable. It saps our energy. We end up punishing ourselves, and we end up playing the if-only game. If only I knew then what I know now. If only I could just erase the past. If only I could turn back the clock. If only I had listened sooner. If only I could take back that bad mistake, that stupid decision, the words I spoke. I would do it so differently today. It's so easy to find ourselves living in a prison of regret and guilt. When we find our lives filled with regret, we really can't live with that. So often we do some psychological gymnastics in order to cope with it. We may blame other people. 
we may pass the buck. Or we just try to bury our guilt and bury our shame and bury our regrets. And we can bury it under booze. We can bury it under pills, drug addictions, half a dozen other things. Many people just try to bury it by staying busy. We can't stand to be quiet because all the past regrets and resentments just crash in on us. So we like to work our tail off so that when we go to bed, we put our head down on the pillow and we fall asleep instantly because we don't like that time when we're laying there thinking about our life. It just doesn't feel too good. I've talked to a lot of people over the last 37 years and many people say, I wish I'd never done that. I, I wish I could call that back. And they live in that prison of regret, trapped by past mistakes. And maybe you felt like that. Maybe you feel like Humpty Dumpty. I mean, nothing can put you back together again. Listen to the message today. God specializes in new beginnings. And folks, that's what Easter is all about. If you don't get anything else this morning, get this. God does not want you walking around with a boatload of guilt. If you think God wants to make you feel guilty, you have a warped view of God. That's why he came up with this plan to relieve it. He sent Jesus Christ to earth to die for all the dumb things that we've done, all our sinful actions, all our stupid decisions, all the selfishness, the thoughtlessness, the unkindness. He died to pay for all my sin and yours so we don't have to pay for it. So let the word of God just reverberate in your spirit. Romans 3.23 says, all of us have sinned, yet God declares us, what does it say there, church? Not guilty if we trust in Jesus Christ, who in his mercy freely takes away our sins. What a deal! If we trust in Christ, he pays for all our mistakes, and we get a get-out-of-jail-free card to boot. I mean, that's called freedom from the pain of our past. If you'd like to be free from resentment and pain, here's what you do. This is advice from one of Job's comforters. Now, they don't have such a good reputation, but this guy got it right. Job 11, verse 13. He says, put your heart right. Reach out to God, then face the world again, firm and courageous. Then all your troubles will fade from your memory like floods that are past and remembered no more. If you're a Newport native... You probably notice the high water mark as you enter Newport on Route 34. You cross the metal bridge, and as you pass through the railroad underpass, you'll see marks on the left wall of the underpass. I remember the many days we spent in 1972 trying to put our town back together after Agnes. What a mess that was. It was a mess. But the memory doesn't bring with it the emotional feelings of pain and loss and exhaustion that I felt back then. I have the memory of it, but there's no sting attached to that memory. And that's what this verse is talking about in Job. Put your heart right and reach out to God. Then you can face the world again, firm and courageous. Then your troubles will fade from your memory like floods that are past and remembered no more. Are you still punishing yourself for your past? Jesus Christ hung on the cross so you could stop hanging yourself on the cross. He was hung up for our hang-ups. He already paid for all of our wrongs. Don't you think that we've been in misery long enough? Don't you think it's time for relief from past resentments and regrets? Jesus Christ wants to set you free from the pain of your past. And this Easter season... If you'll turn it all over to him, he will set you free because he specializes in new beginnings. He'll take away the sin. He'll make you into his image. Jesus Christ wants to set you free from the pain of your past, but he also wants to set you free from the pressures of today. That's the second dimension of freedom. Do you ever feel like your life is out of control? Do you ever feel like it's out of balance? Do you ever get tired of thinking, just thinking about the things that you have to do, that you have to get done? Do you ever wish you could just resign from the human race for a week so you could do whatever you really wanted to do? You know, life is getting so much more complex. It's speeding up. It certainly isn't as simple as it used to be. And we have a growing vocabulary of terms to describe the stress and the pressures that we find ourselves living under today. We say, I'm worn out. 
I'm played out. I'm stressed out. I'm burned out. I'm run down. I'm used up. I'm bushed, exhausted, frazzled, bone weary, dead tired. Help me out here, church. I'm on my last. I'm, I'm at the end of my, I'm ready to throw in the, yeah, you're there. Sometimes the stress gets so heavy that you feel like you're at the breaking point. You feel like you're about to go under for the last time, and you wonder, can I really handle this pressure? And when you're under pressure, you need to do two things. You need strength, and you need stability. Strength and stability, and God offers both of them to you. Isaiah 40, verse 28, read this with me. The everlasting God never grows faint or weary. He gives power to the tired and worn out and strength to the weak. Folks, the reason that some of us are so tired is because we were never meant to live life simply by our own power. God meant for us to have a relationship with him, to be plugged into him, to gain power from God. And when you're out there trying to live all on your own effort, it's no wonder that you hit the wall every time. It's no wonder you're constantly fatigued one time I was working on my laptop in an airport, and it sounded a, a warning that the battery was low. So I found a socket, and I, and I plugged it in, and I kept working. And a few minutes later, it did an emergency shutdown. And I fired it up again, wondering what in the world is going on, and it shut down again. So I checked my power connections, and I found out I had plugged the AC cord very well into the wall, but it wasn't properly connected to my laptop. So I wasn't connected to the source of power. I was still running on a drained battery. You ever tried to live like that? Running on a drained battery? You keep shutting down when your emotional, when your physical, and your spiritual battery is drained. Jesus Christ has all the power we need. And he proved it at Easter. He said, let them kill me and put me in a grave. I'll stay there three days, and then I'm going to bring myself back to life again to prove that I am the Son of God, to prove that I am the Messiah. And that's why several billion people this weekend will celebrate Easter, the most significant event in human history. You see, all of history is divided either into A.D. or B.C. by that event. Every time you write a date, you, you believe, whether or not you believe in Jesus Christ, when you write a date down, you're using Jesus as a reference point. No one ever impacted this world for good like Jesus. And here's the good news. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is available to us today. And if Jesus can raise a dead person, he's the best hope to raise a dead marriage or raise a dead career or raise a dead relationship. He can do anything. He's got all the power we need. When you get God's power in your life, you're set free from the pressures of today because you can handle anything. Like Paul said in Philippians 4.13, he said, I can do everything through the great motivational DVDs I got from Amazon.com. That's not what he said. He's not talking about some self-help, talk yourself into it, positive thinking, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps kind of psychology. He was saying, I can handle everything through who? Him who gives me strength. Why? Because he had God's power in his life. We don't have enough power to make it on our own. We need a source stronger than ourselves to make it in life. And you know, God wired us that way, that we must be connected to him in order to really live the kind of life that he created us to live. So let me ask you a very personal question this Easter Sunday. What's got you stressed out? What are you under pressure about? Is it your finances? Is it conflict in your marriage? Your kids aren't acting right? You're worried about your job. You're worried about your health. What has you stressed out? Instead of giving up, why don't you give it up? Give it up to God. Say, God, you take it. You said you'd help me with the pressures of today. I'm going to give it up to you. If the truth were known, and we could do an x-ray of everyone's heart, that inner part of us, many of us are running on empty. We are emotionally empty. We are spiritually empty. It's what someone called the Kodak syndrome. We've got people who are overexposed and underdeveloped. But we didn't get into this problem overnight. 
and we're not going to get out of it overnight. But we can take a first step today. You can call out to Christ, and you can say, set me free from the pressure of today. Hear the voice of our Savior. I love the, the message paraphrase in this verse in Matthew 11, verse 28. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me and watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Don't lay, I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Can someone say amen to that? Listen, church, if, if you center your life around your career, guess what? You can lose your career. If you send your life around another human being, someday, folks, we're all going to die. We're going to lose that, that center of us then. If you center on anything that changes, then you don't have a solid foundation in your life, and that's going to result in major stress. On the other hand, if you build your life on Jesus, the solid rock of ages, and you make him the cornerstone of your life, you can handle anything that comes along. Jesus Christ wants to set you free from the past, the pain of your past, that is resentment and regrets, and from the pressures of today. And there's a third dimension that he wants to set us free from. He wants to set you free from pessimism about tomorrow. You know, there are a lot of pessimistic people today, and you all said, really? People have lost their faith in a lot of things. They're pessimistic about the moral decay in our society. They're pessimistic about nations being able to live in peace. They're pessimistic about the status of our economy. They're pessimistic about the inability of government to provide leadership in our nation. They're pessimistic about the chaos in our criminal justice system. But really, when you get down to it, most people are discouraged about personal issues. They feel discouraged and defeated because they have lost hope. What is it that causes people to lose hope why is that we lose hope so quickly? Well, you lose hope, first of all, when you're facing a situation that needs to be changed and you can't change it. Whether it's another person you want to change or yourself you want to change or some circumstance that you want to change, you can't change it and so you lose hope. There are many examples in the Bible about this and the psalmist David writes in Psalm 38, kind of listen to this, 38, 12, by the way, whenever you get bummed out, it's really good to read the Psalms. And everyone will find that to be true because you're going to find the psalmist suffered the same thing we did. You're going to find the same thing there. Here's what David writes. Those who would harm me talk of my ruin. All day long they plot deception. And listen to how he describes himself. I'm like a deaf man who cannot hear, like a mute who cannot open his mouth. I've become like a man who does not hear, whose mouth can offer no reply. I mean, he's feeling helpless and hopeless. He's feeling like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I, I, there's nothing there. I don't have anything to put out there. I can't tell you how many people have said to me over 37 years, my marriage is hopeless. You know, I've tried and tried and tried to make this thing work. It's not working. We talked it over. We've gone to a counselor. It isn't working. And the hope just starts to drain out. Or parents will say, I'm watching my kids heading off in this direction. I feel so helpless. I feel so hopeless to get them back on track. I just feel the sense of despair. Or people say, no matter what I do, my finances are getting worse and worse. I'm getting further and further behind. Or my parents, I'm watching them aging in front of my eyes and they're losing their health and I'm just helpless. I feel helpless to do anything about it. Or I see things in my life that I really need to change. I don't want to stay the same. You know, I want to grow. I want to develop. I want to be different. But I just can't get it together no matter what I do. And when you face a situation like that, the hope just starts to drain out of your life. And you say, you know, I guess I'll just settle for second best in life. I guess this is the best I can expect out of my marriage. I guess this is the best I can expect as a single adult. And you lose hope. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 8. Look what Paul said. He said, I begged the Lord three times to take this problem away from me. But he said, my grace is enough for you. When you're weak, my power is made perfect in you. 
God can work through our sense of weakness. He can help us to hold things together until change occurs. It's in our weakness that his power can be displayed. God can give us hope. And there's another reason we lose hope and become pessimistic. And that's when we don't know the purpose for which God made us. The Bible is very clear that God made every one of us here for reason, for a purpose. And if we can't find that, then life becomes pointless. You may begin to think, why bother? Why get up in the morning if there's no purpose to it? Why not just check out right now? You know we're all going to die anyway. Have you ever wondered what God thinks of you? Maybe you've wondered, does God ever think about me? The truth is, God thinks about you all the time, far more than you think about him. And what does he think about you? The Bible tells us what God thinks about you. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. Read this with me. I know what I am planning for you, says the Lord. I have good plans for you, not plans to hurt you. I will give you hope and a good future. In John 10, verse 10, Jesus said, I have come that they might have what, church? Life and have it to the full. I mean, that's what God's thinking about you. His plans for your life are good plans. His plans for your life are hope-filled plans. Folks, we have to have hope. Hope is essential for life. You have to have hope to cope. It's the only way we will. You can live for 40 days without food. You can live about three days without water. You can live about eight minutes without air. But it's sheer agony to live just a short time without hope. The moment you lose hope, you're just existing. You're really not having quality of life anymore. Listen, things may be going really good in your life at this moment. I mean, you got the car, and, and you got the house, and you got the marriage, and you got the kids, and, and it's all good. But when you face the tough times, the inevitable turns in the road, the crisis of life, where's your hope going to be? Good times don't last all the time. No one just sails through life. Just ask the person next to you with gray hair or whose hair has fallen out. You know, there's gray hair under some of the color in here too, by the way. You can ask them. Listen to this letter from a married couple. This couple had previously experienced the death of a baby that had died during delivery due to a genetic disorder. Dear Pastor, as you already know, our infant son died this morning. And for the second time, I watched my precious wife nurture a lifeless baby, gently looking at each finger, each toe, every feature. He's every bit my child, down to the curled pinky fingers, yet his legs are brutally crumpled from spina bifida. He's a beautiful but fragile creation of God. We told our little son many times about the people praying for him, including you and the church family. And they say that babies can hear in the womb. And if that's true, then my son moved into the arms of God, knowing he was loved by many. And most importantly, that he was loved by God. We told him that God had plans for him, plans for good, not for evil, even if the circumstances right now are confusing to us all. You can imagine taking a cold, lifeless baby out of my wife's arms. It didn't easily fit into my idea of a good plan. Yet I have to tell you, in the midst of all our heartache, we were filled with incredible peace from God. And we don't understand why this happened, but we know that God understands, and that's all we need to know. You could almost say this crisis pushed us over the brink. But instead of falling, we found ourselves in the arms of God. I think that's where he wanted us all along. Before, we were running on our own strength, but now we're wholly dependent upon God. And through this, we've learned to bring our heartaches and our broken dreams to God. And now we're watching and waiting and trusting for him to redeem our dreams and to heal our hearts. And that's not a bad legacy for a crippled little boy. 
named Jeremy, who was and is God's gracious gift to us. When inevitable tough times come into your life, who are you going to turn to? Who's your source of hope? Where is your rock? We're living in a time when change is happening so fast that no one in this room can possibly keep up with all the changes going on in our world. Everything is up in the air. And when that happens, we need what, what Alvin Toffler calls islands of stability. We, we need some emotional and spiritual anchors that can never change in our life. Something that holds us steady when it seems like everything else is just flying apart. Do you have a spiritual anchor today? Do you have a relationship with God? Have you made that kind of commitment to him? Psalm 125 verse one says, those who trust in the Lord are as steady as Mount Zion, unmoved by any circumstance. One thing you can know for sure that no matter what happens, the one thing you can count on is that will never stop loving you. Isaiah 54 and verse 10 says, the mountains and the hills may crumble, but my love for you will never end. So says the Lord who loves you. Before you were born, long before you were born, God began orchestrating events in your life to bring you to a point where you could get to know him. You were made to be known and loved by God. He knows everything about you. He wants you to love him. He wants you to enter into a relationship with him and then cultivate that relationship, grow in that relationship. The way we must grow in relationships with human beings if they want them to be beneficial and rewarding. I'm not talking about religion here this morning. I'm not talking about just going to church and punching the clock and waiting for the amen so I can go out and do what's really important. I'm talking about a living relationship with God. Not just that you know about God, but that you know God. God's been trying to get your attention, to get you to slow down just long enough so he could speak into your life and say, you know, you matter to me. You're valuable to me. I've seen every breath you've taken. I've watched you form in your mother's womb. I've seen the good and the bad, and I've seen everything about you, and I still love you. Maybe you felt unworthy. Maybe you felt, I can't come to God because all the stuff that I've done in my life, but you're wrong. Maybe you've had some hard knocks in life. You may have some scars and some hurts. There may be some dirt in your life. Maybe you've made some really bad decisions in life. Maybe you've turned your back on God and you've just lived life your own way, almost as though he didn't exist. But I want you to understand this morning, you have not lost your value to God. You've not lost that value. What matters today is not where you've been. What matters is where your feet are heading right now. That's what's important. What direction are your feet pointed right now? Here's the good news. When Jesus comes into your life, you don't have to clean up your house first. And and he wants to come. Look what he's saying to you in, in the book of Revelation. He says, I stand at the door and I knock. He's talking here about coming into your life. He said, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, the door to your heart, I'll come in and fellowship with him. It means to have a relationship with God. Again, relationship. It's not religion. It's not something that's dead and dried up as as last year's corn stalks. When Christ comes into our life, you don't have to clean up your house first. He doesn't say, get your life together and then come to God. No, he says, let me into your life and I'll help you clean it up. I'll help you to get it together. In fact, there are areas of your life you're never going to get together on your own. That ain't gonna happen. It's just not gonna happen. You've tried, you've failed. You need God's power in your life. And he's saying, let me in. Put me in that rightful place in your life. God has a gift for you through Christ. It's freedom. Freedom from the pain of your past, the pressures of today, and the pessimism, the worry, the doubt, the fear about tomorrow. What a deal. What a deal. But a gift is worthless if you never receive it. You have to take it. And what do you have to lose other than 
the pain of your past and the pressures of today and the pessimism about tomorrow. Let's pray together.